freedom in the utilization of this Bowman bag. We want to send it down to you. Um, Dave and I responded to um, the pinnacles for a 70-something-year-old woman that was just dehydrated, essentially. But to get her out of there was a pretty long hike, so we tried to go in there and do a hoist. Fire captain sent up his worker bees, their non-decision makers, and they were not comfortable doing it. So I always tell people, it seems pretty benign. It looks like a sleep bag, it says head up here, feet down here, Velcro, buckles, this and that. Uh, everything seems pretty easy to understand. Most people will look at it if we had it here right now. You look at it and go, okay, it's easy. The body goes in there, you buckle this, buckle that. But these guys would not send this lady up in it. And I think it was the, the reality that this lady is not hurt, but she's an access problem. And they just were uncomfortable with it. We told them, hey, we'll walk you through it. Will you at least unroll it and look at it? So they continued to tell us, don't feel comfortable. We're like, okay. So we try to land and get almost crashed, trying to get into settling with power into a real nasty little knoll there. So for us, we love presenting this bag because it's our saving grace. We want to pull in there. We want to throw it to you. We want you to look at it. And this tagline is designed to keep it from spinning. It's going to spin a little bit. It's going to go one way or the other. Here at the bottom of the skid tube here, it's inevitably either the feet are going to be under or the head's going to be underneath there. So that's where we'd look for some help. One thing I say about it is we did a demonstration with the Army, and the guys break it right away. It has a breakaway on it. We want it to break away because it should be just gentle force to stop it. He breaks it. I see him looking at me thinking I'm going to lower the load back down to him. I just continue hoisting. We don't actually need it. It's going to spin and be a little bit uncomfortable for the person, but we have the ability to still hoist the load up there and get them secure. So that's kind of it there. This is um, our Bowman bag. We do body recoveries with it. We, we do do, um, traditionally we have a screamer seal. I think there's a photo of that for a non-injured patient that's an access problem. But sometimes this is how we bring our patients up. So there's a misconception that we fly around like this and we'll fly these guys on the outside of the aircraft. We're gonna go take them to the hospital. Unless, unless it's very close, we're not going to. Traditionally what we do is we'll take the load, we'll bring it up, bring them and set them right on this skid step right here. We traditionally have a strap available from inside the aircraft that will anchor into this system here. And then they'll ride right on that step. Traditionally what we do is we'll go from our hoist mission, we'll go land in a nearby meadow or uh, anywhere essentially we can land, and sometimes we'll do a patient transfer there. Or if we're in a remote enough area, we'll take them, set them on the ground, get reconfigured, and then do the medevac right after we do our hoist. But most of the time when we do do hoist rescues, we've made arrangements for an air ambulance to be there. If they meet criteria, uh, we, we don't have to do all of it. We want to be able to do what's right by the patient so we'll have an aircraft where we'll come in and do the thing. When you guys are in your normal control mode, yeah. do you have to reconfigure for place rescue operations? Is that an actual reconfiguring? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, so um, I don't think this video closes. But so when we are in our patrol mode, we, we need to at least land. I need to put on a harness and get into the back. So sometimes it entails we'll strip the aircraft completely, but if we did a hoist rescue around here, because the aircraft's powerful enough, sometimes we don't even have to unload our equipment. I'll get out, put a harness on. We have a nylon guard that goes on the skid there, and it keeps the cable system from getting caught up in it. And then we'll extend the hoist boom and be able to knock it out. So for me, we train a lot in um, helo casts, we call it. So what we, our plan is, is, if there's a victim in the water, we're gonna land, pick up a rescuer, a swimmer, and fly him out to the victim and deploy him. So even that, we'll need a model reconfiguration. I'll throw on a harness, hop in the back, get my victim, probably tie him in with one of those tactical restraints, fly out to the patient, release him, guy jump in the water, gal, and stabilize him until maybe a boat gets there. Or we'll go back and get really reconfigured to do the hoist, so it's kinda, just how tight the space is in there. What's your reconfiguration time for like a rescue operations typically? So, like I say, so if it's just gonna be a helo cast, it'd probably take us about five minutes. 
Um, that's just get completely reconfigured. We just do a safety briefing, get our plan together, and go do our rescue. A, a lot of times there's more time than that. We try not to get rushed into a situation. A lot of times we have to sell the fact of what we want to do compared to what they want to do. They want to do a, a rope system, high and low, blah, blah, blah. You know, we want to just get in there and get out real quick. So roughly five minutes, I'd say. You can get turned around pretty quick. Thanks. Yeah. They have a uh, they have a video of these guys doing a rescue like this, and the litter is actually tied into the rock face there. They send down the hook, the guy grabs the hook, ties it in, and then I believe for about two minutes, the aircraft is tied in through the victim into the rock wall. The pilot is constantly fighting verbals and different things, and so for us, we want to either be the victim's side of the wall or the victim's on the, on the hook with us. So. I always joke with the guys when we're training, it's like fishing to me. Once we have them on the hook, now we're their new safety. They're coming to the aircraft and we're going to get them out of the situation. So that's our screamer. Oh, oh, weird. I wonder how it got its name. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Is, so we have a cinch collar. You'll see it here shortly. Thing is terrible. It has uh, essentially two inch webbing and it cinches around your torso until you can't be cinched anymore. So we, we, no, we have victims that. difficulty breathing or something like that. Imagine putting a strap around somebody and lifting them by. They call it a cinch collar or a horse collar. If you've ever used that thing, you'll love the screamer. The screamer is like a diaper. You just sit back and relax. Most people who ride it are pretty happy. Yeah. This is a lady, this is a non-injured person, but she fell down into one of these gorges by her house and she didn't want to leave her dog, so they hoisted her and her dog. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it seems like misuse, you know, somebody would probably get this and the bloggers would say whatever they want to say about it, but the woman is down there, so until you're down there stuck in a canyon with your dog, who you obviously care about, you know, it's never important to anybody until it's themselves or their family member. And for us, it's not a safety issue. We don't feel we abuse it. We feel very safe doing it. We have hundreds of hours training in it. So that's that cinch collar I was talking about. Kind of funny, it has this padding all around the outside. It's got the strap on the inside. The part that cinches down is on your body. So that just gives it a little bit of flotation because we do use that in the ocean. So the, the guys and gals who train with us, we'll send that down to them. They'll swim to it, grab it, go to their victim, throw it on them, and cinch them up. Quick. That that is that's all that you're <laughs> in as you lift into the air. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and that's not really a collar. It doesn't go around their neck. I would almost <laughs> want it to go around my neck, so I would be unconscious <laughs> on the ascent. Yeah. That okay? Well, that's why I don't like the ocean either. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, I'm sure if you're adrift at sea, yeah. like that probably looks fabulous, but. <laughs> yeah, Dave was hoisting a guy, and he had his hands over his head for whatever reason. Said, like this? Yeah. Well, that doesn't seem. I would death grip on yeah. that thing. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We will train with the guys, and we'll tell them, "Hey, when you get to the skid step there or the skid tube, stop yourself." Some of them they're so afraid they just keep it. <laughs> There is there is a lot of psychological stuff goes on. We have the the rescuers jump out of the aircraft and they have straps to hang on to. And if we do a double deployment, they count to each other to coordinate what time the load comes off the aircraft. So some of the guys, some are more courageous than others. One guy, he holds on to the strap and he can't let go. It's his psyche, he's doing it to him. So he's completely, <laughs> and then finally snaps out of his hand and he's falling sideways. Oh, the other guy threw like a swan dive or something. Three and go. Yeah. <laughs> what three did you mean? Yeah. The second count of three. So just some more pictures of uh, hoist rescues. Sometimes it's just an access thing. We had some guys up there in Big Sur. They were uh, across a gorge. They got off trail. We tried to coach them out of there, and the brush was so bad they were probably.
took them about 20 minutes to even get about 50 feet. And we're like, wow, that sun's gonna set before the guys get out of here. So we reconfigured, went over there and hoisted them out of there. Non-injured, um, but for us, it's the right thing to do. Until you're stuck overnight out in the wilderness, then... Uh, Scott, you might already gonna speak to this, but when you say we reconfigured, what does that mean? Okay, so we talked a little yeah. bit about it. So we have multiple like, oh, repeat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to repeat for me. No, it's, okay. it's not a repeat because we didn't really go into a medevac reconfiguration. So what happens is, is as we patrol in our patrol configuration, I sit left seat, Dave sits right seat, I run the radios, the map, the camera, and Dave flies, runs all his air-to-air -air traffic and stuff like that. When we land, we like to have all our stuff with us. So like I say, we fly roughly 5,000 pounds, but we have, we have heat, um, spare air for if we're over the water with flotation. We have that in aft cargo. We have uh, extra medical equipment. We have go bags. We have uh, our backboard. We have our litter. We have everything with us. So if we go up to the Sierras to do a rescue at 11, 12,000 feet, we might land and get rid of all that stuff. We'll unload everything we have in there, including our FLIR ball. Hopefully we won't even have it on our way up there. But so that reconfiguration would take a longer time because we'd unload all that stuff. Uh, if we do a simple medevac reconfiguration, we figure that it takes us about five minutes. We'll land. My seat's going to come out. It's going to go into the right rear position back there. It's on rails. We'll grab the litter from that right rear and span it out on the left side there. Uh, and then kind of depending on, we did 141 in Clark um, a couple years back, and it was 108 degrees, and we took off with about a seven minute flight. So we get there like, wow, we're very hot. So we actually had to leave the aircraft running, burning fuel, and then we had to unload even more than normal. So our reconfiguration took a little bit longer, but um, what I notice is they're not waiting for us nine times out of 10. They're not going, oh, I wish you guys would reconfigure quicker. They're darting still. They're doing all this critical care. And, and we're like, okay, bring them when you're ready. You know, so they're just wrapping up some of their last minute stuff they want to get done on the more critical patients and give them to us. But essentially it's to transform the aircraft, whether it's going to be to take multiple passengers, take rescuers, do a hoist, do a medevac, we just have our equipment with us, so. And kind of the way it works, let's add, um, so we'll, let's say we're landing for a medevac out at Hawaii, and you guys are there. <coughs> um, Scott will get out and go do his face-to-face -face with you or see multiple patients start helping out. And then I stay at the aircraft and reconfigure, and I'd say more often than like 99% of the time, by the time you guys bring the patient to the helicopter, it's already, I'm kind of sitting there waiting for you. Or we have radios, we can talk back and forth, because it, just because we're there doesn't mean we have to transport. We've done it a bunch where he'll take off to the patient, I'll reconfigure, and then I get the radio call up. We're not taking them, they're going by ground. Like, oh, so I put it all back together the way the patrol configuration, and we're back off. So it's it's pretty quick. Do you guys have any time parameters as far as how long you can be on scene? How Our only parameter is fuel. fuel. Like Scott said earlier, we're there to help you guys. So. Even if it's just an extra set of hands, just because we land doesn't mean we're gonna, we've landed at the dunes, we happen to be patrolling, there's a crash, we'll land, we're there before anybody, you know, as long as we can keep the knuckleheads away from us on their quads. Um, we'll land, assess, then we can either slow everybody down or, you know, hey, you guys can reduce to number two, it's just a, you know, bump or a bruise, or hey, this guy's bad, we're gonna need more resources. So um, our biggest battle is weight. So picture the helicopter hanging off a string from the center, and we gotta keep it balanced for it to fly correctly. And then our, our max gross weight, so fuel, and then if we have too much fuel or too big of a patient, then more equipment's gotta come off. So that's kinda huge if, if you guys are on scene and it's looking like a medevac, give us a heads up on is the big boy or 300 pounder, or, you know, we can kinda, I can start making those adjustments while you guys are doing your face we can start dumping equipment into a patrol car. If we're out in a rural area, we'll just leave it and then drop the patient off and come back and get it. So. Hopefully the relationship we have is you guys recognize us as an asset. 
it seems to me like the first thought is criteria. To us, we're like, we only need to meet criteria to transport. We don't need criteria to respond, to assess. Like say in the very first slide, if we're flying along, we see a TC, and we're all pretty good at it. We're like, wow, everybody's pretty frantic, probably bad situation going on, or people are, you know, <laughs> talking on their phone, calling for their tow truck or whatever. Well, and I had that scenario. We're flying over a Tascadero, crossing 41, and a rollover comes out. And I, I literally look down and I get there. It is. Nobody's on scene. It's just getting dispatched. Um, and it's right next to a big, huge, grassy field. And so I kind of looked with the binoculars, and everybody's, this was back when I was working in the um, Everybody's running around, the car's upside down on its roof. And I'm thinking, that's bad. You know, everybody's running to their car, running back, it kind of frantic. So we land, and I go do the assessment stuff. And it turns out she wasn't very hurt. People are just panicked. But I probably had like four messages from the EMSA <laughs> on my desk by the time we got back to the office. And it's like, we on you, we can land, we can assess. You know, it doesn't mean we didn't transport them. They went by, by ground. Like Scott's saying, that's kind of in our realm. So if it's safe and we can get the thing down and you guys need a hand, like that landing on the freeway for the code and traffic, we'll do it. And EMSA is kind of, that's, they don't govern that part of our job or the rescue mm -hmm. part. So ho hopefully it's not a mindset of, oh, they're here and now I'm going to get QI'd or I have to <laughs> meet criteria, this, that, or whatever. We, hopefully you can find in us and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this way towards you guys transporting, or I'm thinking towards me transporting. For us, we just want to assist the system. So um, we we we'll always offer up to ride with you. If you guys ever need an extra medic, that's fine by us. We don't need to transport a patient. We're not uh, generating money. We don't bill. So for us, we're in our opinion, we're just truly here to help. Whether it is an extra set of hands, hopefully the relationship's not like, ah, oh, man, now i got to wonder what this guy's thinking. Or, you know, sometimes we'll meet the medic and they're like, um, I'm going to take him. Cool. <laughs> cool, you take him. Or they'll say, hey, she's spitting up blood. Okay, I'll take him. Or, you know, we'll work out it together. So this is uh, up there in Paso, the creeks. When we ran one running. day. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, this makes it to the newspaper and everybody beats us up. It's an abusive thing and blah, 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 blah. But to me, who wants the liability of sending that guy in the water? Ah, it's tired deep. Who cares? Get in the water. Now he goes and dies or drowns or whatever. Now we're a bunch of bad guys for that. So for us, we're like, hey, we'll come in here in about five minutes. We'll have that guy off that vehicle and on dry land. So that's what they ended up doing. That's uh, one of the fire guys. That's John. He's going to insert <coughs> insert him onto the vehicle. There's the cinch collar with that uh, flotation on. It's not so bad, so that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to come back and get our guys. So that's a few little cast we were talking about. The guys really enjoy it, jumping into the ocean. That's one of them, I believe. There's one of those perfect jumps I was talking about. <laughs> kind of funny, sometimes we go out to the ocean, it's like a lake, <laughs> and it's very easy. And then sometimes we go out and there's these huge crashing waves, and it's like. So that sling load we talked about it a little bit. So that's actually, <coughs> that rope is connected to the belly of the aircraft. It's right beneath our center of gravity, so we can lift 1,660 pounds. And it's funny, we always brief that we can do it, and the average load of marijuana we do, or debris from a marijuana grow, <laughs> is about 800 pounds. So we lift it up, and the aircraft has an indicator, hey, you're picking up pretty heavy weight, but we always talk about 1,660. We train with the guys to do a horse rescue, and we always use about this 100-pound fake horse. <laughs> So uh, all of a sudden, the guy says, hey, the vet is willing to let us use his mare and uh, oyster or a short hauler. So we're like, well, wow, how much you weigh? <laughs> she's like, I don't know, roughly 1,500 pounds. So I thought, well, we've been saying this for a while, so we have to put our uh, money where our mouth is. So we come in there, the poor thing, they gave her so much uh, 
whatever they give her. <laughs> <laughs> she can hardly stand 